Good. Thank you very much, both of you, um, for some very interesting papers, uh, both in progress, but both with the quite promising and, and interesting uh, aspects as so far uh, regarding the, the, the understanding of what this actually means. Because we can say so much about these practices and these technologies and these different media platforms, but what does it actually mean to people? And what strikes me when, and I think that the, the two papers have put very well together here, because in some respects they are contradictory. And in, in some respects you can say that, that I, I believe you are actually both right. <laughs> I believe you are actually, you actually have 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 some very uh, have have caught some very important uh, aspects of this, but also that the two papers put together illustrates that that this is a very complex field, that it's um, it's a field where both can be true at the same time, maybe not for the same person, but maybe for the same person, but just at different uh, at different parts of their lives. Um, and in different social relations and so on. So what I would actually like to start by asking is the two of you, what you think when you hear the other person giving their talk and, and, and how these contradictories and how these ambiguities are also uh, maybe present in, in some of your work. That on one hand, people are sharing, seeing themselves through the gaze of other people, uh, maybe or maybe not being influenced by this, but on the other hand, people want to be alone with their data and they just want to use them for, for quite private uh, purposes. Um, so how can this be? I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, I think it's that's an in interesting question and it kind of makes me think of, we talked about a little bit earlier, if 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 tracking was just a phase, some and I think what what both of our presentations kind of highlight is that, for example, from my point of view, the informants I talked or the participants I talked about today, they're in a very early stage of uh, starting to exercise, and for them it's a very private thing. And what I didn't tell was that some of the other participants I have who have been exercising for their whole lives they have other kinds of sharing practices. And they have also been through some sort of journey in which they started out with tracking as a very private thing and the media use as a very private thing with a very limited social network on the tracking apps. And then this sort of, uh, as they get more and more comfortable with the exercise practice, they uh, their usage also evolves, so they start to share. Um, Mostly with, uh, yeah, in, in, in different kinds of, kinds of ways. So I, I think you can see sort of an, and in the practice sort of evolves. Yeah, I think for my work, I think it depends on what kind of user you're looking at. And I'm not focusing on just exercise. I'm more interested in looking at health practice as a whole. And I'm interested in tying in lifestyle into health and how different things are now becoming representative of health practice. So sharing an Instagram image or even talking on Facebook about how you're feeling one day if you're tired or stressed um, to sharing data or improvements mm -hmm in your running, for example. So I think in that regard, it depends what kind of user you're looking at and what information they're sharing and why. And my participants that were trying to optimize or improve, ones that were training for a marathon or trying to lose weight, were only willing to share, were only willing to be public about that information once they'd hit a certain point of optimization, once they were able to feel that they were re represent this idealized self that they were striving towards, even though it all, you know, that's a, a constant cycle, that cycle never ends. Um, so I think it just depends who you're looking at to do with the different levels of kind of exposure and self-censorship in terms of what people are sharing and what they're keeping, keeping private. What I also experienced uh, during the interviews what this, uh, is that there's a certain sort of normativity regarding what is uh, okay to share on social media. And many of the participants were quite, uh, they all said that 
milestones are sort of the thing that you are allowed to share, but you're not allowed to share every single run on, for example, Facebook or Twitter. So even though it might only be two kilometers or three kilometers, uh, you are allowed to share this on uh, Facebook if if it's a, a sort of a milestone to you. And that struck me that, uh, that they were all kind of agreeing on that, uh, my... Uh, participants, even though it was individual interviews, so they, they they didn't talk to each other and stuff. Yeah, there seems to be this real kind of etiquette that's evolving from oversharing. Um, that is that is managing that is pushing people. That's kind of um, pushing them to share or not share certain information on how much they're sharing and why, because there seems to be this real stigma now that's attached to oversharing. I think we're entering this kind of new phase of social media where initially we all went on and we were sharing everything about our lives and. You know, thankfully, that horrible memories thing that pops up all the time reminds you of all the, all the oversharing that everyone's done over the years. And now there's this kind of idea that, no, you have to be very careful about what you're sharing and why. And I think that, and that's what I meant about being conscious about what's public and private now, is that people are, are aware of what information is going out there and why, and the etiquettes that are associated with that as well, I think. Well, that was actually one of the questions I would like to ask you because of some of the examples that you had here, you had this very nice example about this uh, this guy. I, I just pictured a colleague coming up to him and saying, "Hey, why didn't you post your run yesterday? Weren't you out running yesterday?" And 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 you could I don't know how it how the words fell at at the time, but it could also be an ironic uh, statement. Whoa, you forgot to post? How you were. Just, but but how did you how did you see these changes? Because yes, I, I assume there is quite a change, and yes, Facebook are definitely <laughs> reminding us yeah. that there is quite a change in the way that we're using these social media, and maybe it also has to do with different generations using different uh, social media for different purposes and 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 doing it uh, in different ways. But did did any of your informants? talk about these issues also uh yeah they kind of um i mean as i kind of mentioned before it it was once you're reaching these milestones that seems to kind of legitimate yeah. what you can share and why mm. um but with with that participant in, in particular he he wasn't even a colleague he was actually like a acquaintance someone had met from a friend of a friend and had yeah. privately messaged him on facebook so it wasn't even like somebody he was meeting okay, face so to face no, no, no. He, uh, he wasn't a passing comment in the hallway at work or anything like that. It was that he actively went onto Facebook and sent him a private message. And he hadn't spoken or heard from this friend acquaintance for many, many years, um, which I found fascinating that he kind of had the guts to <laughs> question why he hadn't done the run. And he had, but he suddenly felt um, this weird sense of being, uh, well, surveyed by the community, but the imagined community. Um, so, yeah, I think it's... Um, I think there's a, there is a generational divide, definitely. I think that um, the younger generations seem to be far more um, aware of the impact of the representation um, in terms of whether that's it just internalised they're kind of very hyper-conscious and concerned about how they're going to be perceived by the wider community. Whereas I found, I mean, this is generalisations at this point and it's very early on in the in the study, but the elder generations were happy just to, just to share this information and were far more relaxed about the information that they were sharing. Um, and then, and as you're saying, you're, you're at an early phase in this study, but but what, what you have been talking about was also how these practices may influence their lifestyle choices in, in their offline mm -hmm. life. Do you have any ideas where this part of the analysis will will take you, or have you have you talked to people about that? Have you have you had any uh, sim also similar to to the things that you've been talking about about the, the more sensory experiences of of making lifestyle choices as a, as a in the in a broad sense yeah yeah definitely i mean it was the nudges and the devices and that's coming particularly from the actual health applications itself so things like night plus and at my run mm -hmm. those were the devices that were making the users feel that they should be you know the reminding mm -hmm. they should be going for runs they should be calorie counting or you know if they have an input in their x amount of calories per day versus their kind of exercise expenditure that they were being pushed by the device to manage that um, but I also think that when you're talking about just the self-presentation on social media so not necessarily the actual health technology itself 
the, the the perception from the wider community is it was an influence as well when they were seeing other people you know whether it was trying to lose weight or talking about going for a run or even just images of people posting um you know salads or healthy dinners that they're having i think that makes it puts people within the space where is a health community there there's a consciousness where people are going oh well i feel like i should be doing that too and so there is that kind of underlying um moralism that as it seems to be occurring within the online communities and not just uh, my argument is not just within health communities and so not just within the actual apps itself but within social media it's enabling these kind of new communities to evolve but ones that aren't necessarily talked about it's not a forum set up mm -hmm. so it's it can be quite internalized these kind of um pressures that, that the users are feeling yeah and probably also because the community is bigger than the people who are actually posting things on social media and and, and has influence on, on more people like in in different ways um um i was thinking about yeah a little bit more about the the, the most sensory and 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 the more emotional aspects uh, in in both of your your presentations you also said rachel at, at one point that the devices can't capture the emotional status of a person they do try to do so i have a tracker in my phone who asks me how i'm doing uh if and they if it it measures my 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 pulse or my in some way they say they measure my stress level and then they ask me how how i'm feeling in relation to that and also of course facebook has this how are you how are you feeling are you frustrated are you happy are you whatever so so they do try to capture your emotional status and you talk a lot about how emotions and ambiguities and frustrations are sort of being either suppressed or, or accentuated through the the use of of digital technologies um in your case in the in the actual uh, exercise practice and in your case perhaps more on an, on an all overall everyday life level but i don't know if any of you want to elaborate a little bit more on, on the things about yeah, what this uh, I'm starting to think about method when you say that, uh, and uh, and that is because I've I've been struggling a bit with how to get at this experience. How do we research people's practices of media use, and especially when you are dealing with such a thing such as smartphones and and uh, and small wearables and stuff, because a lot of the usage usage is sort of embedded in our. Um, you know, bodily way of it's, it's not something that we think a lot about. We're just doing it. And how how do we get people to reflect on on what they're doing in this sense? It's um, it's it's very much. I, I'm not sure how to to explain it, but it's it's a very bodily way of using media that is maybe not that reflective or that people are not that reflective about compared to uh, other kinds of usage, uh, maybe because. What I've experienced is that the interviews that I've made, uh, they are decontextualized from the practice itself. They, um, it's it's not, uh, and and it's very difficult to, to go on a run with someone and ask them what are you feeling because then you you're starting to, to um, ruining the practice that they are, they are experiencing. So. Maybe because you have trouble breathing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So, so how do we research this experience? Because uh, you, you can't do it while they're running, but you can't really do it after either. And you can't go to the gym and stalk someone uh, running on a treadmill and, uh, because it, it's creepy, <laughs> first of all. And second of all, because you can't see what is actually taking place on the screen. And third of all, because that doesn't say anything about what they're, the way they're relating to, to the device and, and the data that they are tracking. So, so that is kind of a me methodological um, problem or a, um, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm, they're trying to engage the users to be reflexive about their practice is, is so hard because they, uh, well, even a lot of the initial interviews I was doing were just trying to understand, trying to engage the users and just to talk about health practice, what they actually thought was health practice. Um, and a lot of them didn't really 
couldn't identify that in their own minds. And then I would ask them, well, why are you using these technologies? You know, just initially, what are you doing this for? What are you trying to get out of it? And, and, and not one single person could give me an answer to that question. So they're obviously getting something out of it. And it's this kind of acquisition of data. And they, they like seeing the, the fancy leaderboards. And they like the feedback from the social media communities. So I guess it's a gratification of the evidence of data. But yeah, it's a methodological issue in terms of how do you actually get them to engage on a reflexive level. Um, and so the, I've, I've used guided reflexive diaries before in my master's work with interviews to try and contextualize the interviews. Um, and getting them to do that on the days when they are practicing their health, whatever that may be, whether that's sharing content or going for a run, um, just to try and understand from a self-representational point what they're sharing, why they're sharing it, and how it's making, with the community feedback, how that's then making them feel offline. Um, but it seems so commonsensical and mundane for a lot of them, so it's trying to get, engage them in those practices that they're just doing anyway, and they're not actually thinking why they're doing it. And you're actually only talking to people who are sharing stuff, who are using these technologies. Not necessarily, no, because that would be another yeah. issue. How do you how do you measure? How do you how do you talk about the non-users yeah. or the the that's followers? So that's yeah. why I'm interested in looking at just how an everyday person uses it. It's not people that are necessarily managing particular illness or trying to train for a marathon or lose weight. It's more about how the everyday person is using it because. I think silences are interesting. We were discussing this briefly over lunch. You know, when people aren't sharing, but they're still on these sites, they're still watching other people. Why are they doing that? But they're not like publicly feeding back, obviously. Um, and I think it's interesting, yeah, why certain people aren't sharing this information. I think that needs to kind of be um, looked into. But then it's very hard to identify the silences um, and explore that in that way. But I don't know if this would be a good time to ask the audience <laughs> call a friend or something <laughs> maybe some of you have some some thoughts on these matters okay i'm gonna start maybe with the tv she did first thank you so much actually uh, my question fits uh leads on very closely to what you were just talking about rachel um, which has to do with your methodology. And um, I was very interested to see you're using Faircloth and critical discourse analysis. I just was curious how you're putting that into practice. So, yeah, that's my question. So with regards to critical discourse analysis, I'm just really interested in looking at the, the power relations. That's why I'm looking at it in that way. Um, so Foucauldian analysis. Um, trying to tease out, you know, what are a lot of mundane reflections, but trying to understand, you know, there's a moralization of health that seems to be occurring and, and it's the way that people talk about it is is fascinating if you're looking at it with with regards to power relations within on a state level um from the state from like a socio-economic and political level but also within themselves and the kind of contentions between what we want to do as a person and what we feel we should do in society and also the way we talk about that as well and often with health practice what's really interesting is the way that people talk about their health and their body is it's very private it's a very private practice um we operating in a very image, you know, conscious culture. We all know that we're a very visual culture now, um, and so the representation of our bodies and ourselves has become integral to our sense of sense of self and well-being. Um, so the way that we then talk about that, uh, people I think struggle with. Um, People struggle with talking about it because it's very personal. It's about the body. It's about themselves. And so you have to try and kind of like pull away at all those kind of cultural assumptions of people wanting to, oh, I just want to lose weight because I want to look better. You want to kind of pull it apart a little bit and see why they're doing it. And I had one, in, one uh, interview actually for my master's work where I was speaking to um, a young woman in her late teens, early 20s about her health practice very generally. And I was just asking um, if she, who she felt was responsible for her health, whether she felt it was herself or the state, um, or, you know, the NHS, as this was in the UK. And she said that she felt that she was responsible for her health and she had to maintain it and manage it and look, look after herself. And I said, do you not, you know, do you, I kind of was teasing out this more and I was like, do you not think that there's a responsibility of a government to provide a healthcare system? And that's an, a, le an, a level of responsibility that should be available to you. Um, in the, within the UK and she said oh not really but then I got really ill and I went into hospital and it was a relief because I knew the doctors could just look after me and so and so I think there you kind of see that kind of tension between there's this internal 
discourse, this internal way of um, pressure, this pressure, privatised pressure, an individualised pressure that we're putting on ourselves. And it's only when we get put into the hands of the medical profession and the authority that comes with that that we kind of let go of that responsibility. And I, I felt that that, what she said to me, the language she was using there was kind of providing that kind of contention and issue that, that I think is happening and that I think is being kind of advocated by these devices, um, if that makes sense. Um, I thought both papers were great, particularly uh, in relation to how things become meaningful. I thought it really shined through and it was really good. This is a question for Joe. And you talked at one stage about um, people having trust in the devices, and then you finished up by saying that it matters less what the data actually says. And to me, there's a slight contradiction there. But I, so what I'm wondering about is, is trust and how people think about trust. Do they trust the devices to get them out and running, or do they not trust the accuracy of the data? Or What's the issue there? It's not really sort of trusting the data output. It's it's sort of a trust, a general trust placed in the device as something that is able to help you to run. Because there's been a lot of uh, effort put into these apps. Uh, there's been engineers and some uh, exercise uh, people, physical uh, uh, trainers have have been in on this process, and it's. Of course, it, is, it also relates to many of the, info, of the participants that talk about use these training apps uh, that tells you uh, you're going to run now for the next minute or, uh, or the next 30 seconds. And actually, that was also on my slide, but I, I didn't talk about it. Um, then they, they sort of they trust that because someone uh, with, with the skills uh, um, with skills has kind of, um, how do you say it? There's someone, um, because there's been a physical trainer saying that I can do this, then I will be able to do this. So that is kind of where the trust lies uh, concerning, for example, training apps and stuff. I don't know if that was sort of an answer or if you... Yeah. So uh, I thought that was a really fascinating question and because that ties your two things together that you just said because maybe it's like we used to have trust in the, well, we do have trust in the doctors, right? But it's become more individualized and then we don't maybe have access to the doctors as much, I don't know. And then the, the app comes in and obviously that's a really interesting possible parallel maybe. That wasn't actually the question I was going to ask though. <laughs> Can I ask another one too? Uh, okay, so that's one question. Is there actually a parallel there between you trust the doctors, you trust the, the app because it's like got authority of some sense? That's one question. And then um, another question, um, was um, really for Rachel, because you, you say you're writing about, um, you're interested in, in health apps and stuff, but your examples so far anyway are the, the running apps and the, the sort of the healthy body who doesn't need a doctor, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was wondering about all the, I mean, there's so many other forms of self-representation and health online. Like, I mean, there's all the, the sickness blogs, there's um, community sites like where you track fertility together or you patients like me where you write about your what medicines you're taking and all this stuff and um, or the experience of um, you know a diabetic a diabetic person who has to track um, I mean they do very detailed health tracking right so there's so many other kinds of health and quantified self and digital media you could have looked at will you be looking at those other things as well or are you focusing on this sort of healthy lifestyle? I, well, initially I was just really interested in looking at running applications and at digital health technology and the, the applications in itself but my interest has increasingly moved away from that and it's more about how just how not necessarily looking at patients or people that are trying to manage particular illnesses or issues or, or as different aspects of their life it's more just about how a lay person is health is becoming more and more integrated into their lifestyle practices and how that's influencing their self-representation because I feel that health is shifting so much it's becoming so representative of different ways of being in the world um, you know when I'm looking at representation on social media I'm thinking about things like Instagram images or talking about health or talking about feeling unwell or tired or overworked or I'm looking at health in a very broad very very broad sense and I'm interested to see how how the everyday person 
understands health? What does health mean to them now? Because it seems that it's kind of creeping and encroaching on lots of different areas of our lives where it, it wasn't before. Before we simply health was, you know, um, good or bad health to, to an extent. Um, you know, you either, um, yeah, you had an illness or you didn't. Whereas now I feel that there's lots of different ways that we can understand health practice and that health practice is um, becoming, as I've touched on before, about this moralization of health, about becoming an active citizen and an active consumer, about making sure you're having, um, that, for example, in the, in the UK, you're five a day, and those different kind of policies that are encouraging you to behave in certain ways. Um, and it's kind of it's making it's making the everyday person become a lay expert to an extent, you know. And, and through the devices, we can kind of adopt to an extent this kind of medical gaze. We can see our body in ways that we've never been able to see it before. That only was able to by doctors and people with access to certain technologies or expertise. Um, and so I think I do think people. I think there is still a status and a, um, an authority that in the UK certainly that people ascribe to the medical profession definitely. But I feel that. And, but that's now the last resort, whereas it used to be your first resort used to be going to the GP. I think that it's shifting now that before there's this mass kind of misinformation and information we're kind of taught to self-diagnose and acquire all this information before we get to that point. And I think it's it's that um, issue that I'm kind of interested in exploring is is how are people trying to understand whether they are in good or bad health? What does that mean to individual people? Regarding the trust issue, I guess it's not only about trust in in the individual lab, it's also about that a lot of people have this fascination of technology in general. So we have kind of a general feeling that if there is a new exercise technology, we have the trust that it would help us in some way. And a lot of the participants that I interview, they all talk about it. It's funny to pay attention to the verbs that they use uh, when talking about technology in general, because they talk about, I stumbled upon this app. Uh, I've, in Danish, it, it, it would be fall directly to, to I fell upon this app. So it was like they use these words that it's almost like walking in the forest and picking up a stick because they are so available, all of these kinds of, kinds of apps. And we have a general fascination of technology and trust in technology. Um, but on an individual app level, I guess that um, in the case of many of the training programs, there's um, like you have these pictures of fit people and fit physical trainers who are quoting this and that, and I guess that is sort of the way that they uh, sort of uh, make us trust them on an individual individual level. Because um, you also mentioned that they, were like, they felt like the world is a professional trainer in Australia and it looks pretty buff. Um, so I trust the app because he'll help me. And I was wondering, does anyone use Headspace? It's like this meditation app. Yeah. So that's exactly what that app's about. I mean, it's like this calm English voice. And he'll look after, he can make me meditate, I'm sure, <laughs> if I just use the app and look back at my history. And so, I mean, so, so there's a very personified thing. I mean, I can't remember his name, but he's got that voice, you know. And Andy, Andy something. Right, right. But, but, but is it the app or, I mean, is it the data or the person? It's my question, I guess. Or maybe it's a combination. It, it depends on which app you use, I guess, kind of because, yeah, no, but it must be some kind of combination because the app is sort of personified. But again, in the, in the case of my participants, it's also very important that there's not another physical person present, right? So it needs to be a device, but simultaneously it also needs to have some sort of... Uh, human-like uh, status. So combination would be the answer, I guess. Actually, maybe the reason it works is I know Andy doesn't actually see me, so it's like he's actually... Uh, there's a, the, Kate Crawford's done this interesting work on lurkers, and like it's listening and it's an active kind of labour, and actually maybe we like the apps because they don't hear us, but they're personal somehow, I don't know. I th yeah, I think I think that's a key thing. I think that it's quite hard, as I mentioned, talking about your body and your health. So it's hard when you go to a GP and you have to explain all that information. Whereas I think we're far more comfortable in searching online, self-diagnosis. I think we see it far comfortably in that space where we can um, explore all of these opportunities for ill health or good health. And um, and yeah, that's it, I think. And there is um, there is trust 
issues there I think and to kind of go back to your trust point I think that my my worry my what I kind of find really problematic is that that people are really trusting a lot of these applications and they're not accurate and they're not um, as you know you mentioned earlier obviously with Nike Plus uh, Nike Fuel sorry um, and and that's my contention is that when you're putting all of your um or your trust and belief into a device and you're quantifying aspects of your being and you're pushing yourself perhaps to run further or faster or eat less because the app's told you that you've gone over your calorie consumption for X amount of days, like my fitness pal does, for example, that um, no human body can be fully quantified and there's no one f- one size fit all model for each for individual users. And that's the issue, I think, is that a lot of people are just using these apps and they are trusting them. And that's um, potentially quite worrying, I think, in the long term in terms of, yeah, not everybody is the same and the apps treat everybody as though they are the same. I just have just one comment in relation to that because I, I don't think that's necessarily all the, always the case that people are blindly trusting these apps. They are, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to to use like MyFitnessPal or any kind of, of, of a food tracker because there is a constant negotiation going on between you and the app because you know that you are not accurate yourself. You just say, ah, ah, well, it was about this amount of this and that. And and sometimes you you scale up or you scale down on, on, on different issues and stuff. So the, it's a much more complex relationship between you and that kind of persona or whatever. It might be a, 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 some sort of persona understanding of, of, of somebody in the on the other end of that line. And that, of course, also relates to, to whether or not you want to share with actual people because they, w- they might come back to you and say, no, you didn't run yeah. or why didn't you track or because whatever. The idea around cheating that we were saying earlier. Yeah. So... Yeah, yeah. The, uh, there's a lot of self-censorship that occurs within yeah. the app, so not yeah. putting in all the food that you've yeah. done. Or I've heard stories of people competing, um, n- not actually together physically, but um, all t- groups of friends trying to run a certain amount of miles a week. And some people um, put it and trying to be on a leaderboards, and some people just putting it on their car or their yeah. bike yeah. or something. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, of course there is aspects of it. It's, it is a contention. It's not yeah. black and white. No, definitely not. I, I really enjoyed both talks and I was just uh, thinking about actually kind of on that point um, two analytical um, points that you both made which sort of came together and, and Rachel um, used this phrase of uh, the healthy self which is presented online and you use this um, phrase uh, like hanging out with the datafied self you know kind of waiting for the bus and looking at the data and it, and it kind of seemed to me almost like the datafied self is is, is like Goffman's uh, backstage kind of performance and the healthy self is the, the sort of the filtered version Possibly, literally, with an Instagram filter, maybe I don't know. Um, uh, th- th- that's the, the 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 front stage performance, um, and it seemed like there was that kind of um, w- w- what you thought about that. If, if that's a kind of a workable way of uh, of thinking about that that distinction. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really really helpful. Actually, I think. Um because I, yeah, I can't kind of see the data as, as totally behind the scenes. Because obviously, the self representation aspects what really really interests me. Um, and how people interpret that and how they and how they also present it, because obviously, you know, with all the applications, you can screenshot certain bits of it. You don't have to show everything. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting tool. Again, that kind of ties into not cheating necessarily, but just the way it's carefully constructed. Yeah, I think the way that you can very carefully construct that idealized self. Yeah. I think you can talk about the, the tracking data as some sort of of backstage performance, but it, it's it's still really not backstage because it's still available. Of, of course, the hanging out is a backstage performance. Oh, yeah, that was what you're meaning. Um, but I just came to think about because one of my participants talks about sharing practices. She's not one of the ones who struggle, but she's one who exercises uh, fairly much, actually. But And she has um, started to track her runs, and she's become fun of doing this. But now she's actually in a dilemma because she's also a, a mother um, of a, a baby boy, and she is friends with uh, on 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 the tracking app with a lot of the people f- uh, from her What's that called? Ma- maternal group, maternal community, and suddenly she needs to 
She feels the need to exercise less because it becomes visible how much she is exercising. So that is <laughs> that is actually tracking is not only a, a positive thing, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay, I think it's time for some coffee. <coughs> Thank you very much for the.